talk about digital modulation schemes, right? Mm -hmm. And we had described the process of digital modulation as one of mapping a message sequence into a set of a sequence of waveforms, right? This mapping essentially is carried out so that we can eventually communicate on a waveform channel, right? And we had uh, made uh, a review of uh, what kind of constraints are present on a waveform channel, namely power constraints and bandwidth constraints, and how to design waveforms keeping these constraints in mind. Um, today we'll uh, basically last time we discussed the case of binary modulations and binary baseband modulations to be more specific, and today we'll uh, extend our talk on baseband modulations to consider the case of Emery situations, that is Emery digital modulations in the baseband uh, situation. Now Emery modulations, Emery baseband modulations or baseband waveforms for Emery modulations are what we are going to discuss today. And as before, we can do this discussion, we can carry out this discussion in the context of either bandwidth constraint channels or in the con context, context of power constraint channels. At the moment, we are going to look at waveforms which, in which there is no bandwidth constraint. There may be a power constraint, but there is no bandwidth constraint. And uh, for this kind of waveform channels, um, primarily, as I was telling you last time, there are two basic kinds of Emery alphabets that we can use, right? And these are orthogonal and simplex. Let me first take the case of Emery orthogonal signaling. Here we use a set of M waveforms. So we use a set of this M uh, is the same M symbol that we used for the Emery here. A set of M waveforms, let's call them uh, S, -M S sub M T, where small m takes the values, let's say, uh, between 0 to M minus 1. Okay, having the following properties. First, they all have the same energy E sub P, right? They all have the same energy, uh, that is if you were to compute the energy of each of these signals, this E sub P referring to the fact that this is the energy of the pulse P uh, corresponding to the waveform. SMT, which is S sub M square dt. More precisely, we can write some amplitude A square and we can take the mod square if you are talking of complex waveforms, right? So A square SMT whole square between uh, 0 to infinity or minus infinity to infinity, whatever you like to use. So they have the same energy. And secondly, they are orthogonal to each other in the same way that we discussed for the binary case. So the second property that this satisfies is that if you take any two of these waveforms, let's say SMT and SNT, conjugate, multiply them, integrate, the result is 0. Yes, that's important for M not equal to N. Because for m equal to n, this will reduce to the energy integral, right? Uh, the value of this constant a that you have got here in this expression, uh, this can be chosen as per our convenience. Sometimes we choose a equal to 1, sometimes we can choose a equal to square root of Ep, so that uh, this basic signal SMT is having unit energy, right? So depending on the convenience, we can choose. Uh, a to be either 1 or 
square root of Vp. When, when you choose A equal to 1, that implies that energy in SMC is equal to Vp. When you choose A equal to square root of Vp, that means you are considering a normalized version of SMT whose energy itself is unity. So that is a matter of convenience, whatever you like to uh, choose, you can choose. What about the value of M? For convenience of mapping sequences into waveforms, and typically we are going to work with binary sequences, right, which we are going to map into waveforms, uh, it is preferred to choose M to be a power of so m is equal to 2 to the power k, which permits uh, convenient mapping, all right. Because we can take a sequence of k pulses, uh, k, uh, k bits coming in and decide on, depending on the sequence, one of these m waveforms for mapping. For transmission, right? Now, although I have talked about orthogonality in this sense, uh, usually, and I have taken this, these time limits to be infinite, usually each of these signals will be time limited, right? So, uh, if for example we have a strictly time li limited set of pulses, then uh, we can talk of, um, in fact, let us ignore that fact for the time being, but what is more important is we are transmitting these waveforms from one set of bits to another set of bits. One set of k bits will be mapped onto this waveform, then the next set, then the next set and so on. There is another condition of orthogonality which if satisfied by the waveforms is really helpful at the receiver and that is um, SMT is not only orthogonal to SNT for M not equal to N, but also to SN conjugate T minus LT. And now it is for all values of M and N, right, including M equal to N. That is, we would prefer the signal set that we have selected to be orthogonal not only in this sense, but also in this sense where we are looking at the correlation. Essentially, you can think of this integral as some kind of a correlation between the two waveforms. The correlation between SMT and any translated signal from the set where the amount of translation is a multiple of the symbol duration, the waveform duration. Uh, L cannot be 0, L not equal to 0, right, because that is already here, that condition is already here, for L equal to 0 we already, so when you put L equal to 0, then M and N have to be different, that is why I have put that condition separately and this condition separately, right, for L equal to 0 we cannot allow M equal to N, that is the only difference, otherwise yes, right, they are the same. So. This only says that a signal in the set is orthogonal to every other signal in the set with and without translation. And the amount of translation we are talking about is symbol duration or the waveform duration, right. Of course, it is um, it's better to call, uh, call symbol duration as long as I am maintaining the limits to be infinity here. But it is obvious that if each of these waveforms is itself limited to t seconds, then the second condition will be always satisfied without any problem, right. If not, then we have to make sure that it is through this integral. So is this last point clear? The third condition that I have talked about here will be always satisfi satisfied for a set of waveforms in which every waveform has a duration of t seconds because the moment you translate it by a multiple of t seconds, there will be no overlap between the original waveform and the translated waveform and therefore the product will be 0 and the integral will be automatically 0. Now this is a very useful and important property just like this is at the receiver. Remember this condition is important so as to distinguish between different kinds of signals that you may like to transmit corresponding to different message sequences. This condition is important again from the point of view of intersimple interference and things like that. That is signal transmitted in one interval does not interfere with that trans transmitted in the 
subsequent to right in some sense and the sense that you're looking here is that of correlation that it has no correlation with sim, uh, signal transmitted in another symbol duration okay so the mapping let me although we have discussed the mapping sufficiently but just to complete the discussion a mapping that we are going to do is such that we will take uh, the mth symbol call it m you have m possible symbols capital m symbols 0 to m minus 1 m denotes the mth such symbol this will be mapped onto the waveform smt which in turn will be transmitted onto a waveform channel right and the way this will be done is that your bit stream that is coming in incoming bit stream because usually most sources will be binary in nature right will be broken up into uh, k bit blocks right so broken up into k bit blocks or which you can call k bit bytes or k bit words or whatever you like to call them and the lth word that is during the lth time interval defines a specific number m sub l right which implies that you will have to transmit the waveform corresponding to the index m sub l right the symbol m sub l which will be s sub m l t and your overall transmitted waveform if we call that c of t will be um, the sum of these kind these waveforms translate from symbol to symbol for all l right the sum of all these pulses is what you finally transmit of course these pulses are all mutually uh, displaced with respect to each other by symbol duration uh, remember i defined k a few minutes ago this k is related by m equal to 2 to the power k right so we take an in incoming bit stream that is coming in coming along let's say let's say we select k equal to 3 so we select the symbol value here here and here look at this this will define a specific symbol by which you are going to denote this sequence right call it m sub l for example in this case you may denote use a symbol 0 to 7 right for a 3 bit block and then depending on what this value is you will choose a specific waveform for transmission and the final transmitted waveform will be a sum of all these pulses coming one after another right and of course this uh, this capital T here will correspond to uh, the duration over which these three symbols have been accumulated or these k symbols have been accumulated because from one set of k symbols you have to go to the next set of k symbols right that is the way the mapping will be done so instead of each waveform carrying binary information it is carrying information about a block of bits rather than a single bit that is the essential difference between memory modulation modulations and binary modulation right and there are advantages and disadvantages of doing things like that <coughs> I am sure you can think of some of those yourself at the demodulator which we will discuss in detail separately but broadly what the demodulator will now have to do because we have talked about binary demodulators at least very crudely earlier let us very crudely talk about the memory demodulators it will have to somehow produce an estimate m ml hat of ml from the received waveform uh, which may be noisy so from the received noisy waveform
right? If somehow we produce an estimate which is different from what was actually transmitted, you have committed an error. This indicates that you have committed a mistake. That is, you are now going to decode your bit sequence wrongly. Fine. Is the basic concept of memory modulation clear and memory orthogonal modulation? Let me illustrate by means of a diagram. What do you do? Okay, that is something we will be talking about in detail when we come to demodulators, right? Just like in the binary case, we have to produce a decision that uh, whether a 1 or a 0 was transmitted. Here, I am only indicating what the demodulator functionally has to do. It has to produce functionally an, es an estimate of M sub L, right? How it is to be done is something we will take up when we talk about demodulation in general. Now, let me give a few examples of uh, orthogonal waveforms. I have taken the value m equal to 4 for these examples for illustration. Here is the set of four waveforms uh, which you may call S O T, S sub 1 T, S sub 2 T, S sub 3 T, right, which you may use for the situation that m equals 4. So essentially you see that over the simple duration z between 0 to t, I have essentially a sine wave of a different frequency going in. And in the same way that we discussed the binary FSK, you can think of this as a 4 array FS, FSK case. All that is needed is that each of these sine waves has a frequency which is an integer multiple of 1 by t, 1 by 2t, right. Now uh, I think at this point I would like to uh, go back to the discussion that we had yes, uh, last time about orthogonal FSK kind of waveforms. Some of you had expressed a doubt that there will be a uh, DC standing on the wave, uh, on the transmitted waveform, right. For the, for the examples that we selected, it looked as if there will be DC on the wave, uh, DC on the channel. Uh, well, that is only uh, that was only an example. It was not to be taken that seriously. That just showed an example of orthogonal set of binary waveforms, right? For example, in this case, you will see there is no DC because each waveform is balanced in terms of positive and negative cycles. You could have selected even for those examples a waveform set like that, right? So that was just an example to indicate that those are the kinds of waveforms which can be called to be orthogonal, right. But if DC is a problem which you need to avoid, you can choose these waveforms more carefully, right. So, so that was just to… They were giving us a smaller bandwidth requirement, that is you could have F and 3 by 2 F and there will, be, there will be other considerations. Typically, of course here we are talking about base band, if, it were, if you are talking about pass band, uh, even half a cycle of uh, mismatch in terms of DC will not make that much difference. And actually speaking, orthogonal waveforms uh, really are useful when they are used with large values of m, not with small values of m. And when you are using them with large values of m, um, these, these considerations become very secondary, okay. So anyway, uh, I thought since that point came up for discussion last time, which I could not satisfactorily address, I should uh, at least point this out to you at this point. So this is one example of uh, orthogonal signaling. Here is another example of orthogonal signaling, very simple trivial kind of example. So here is uh, your SOT which is the waveform is to be regarded of duration T up to here. So it starts here and ends here, right. Again S1T starts here and ends here. Right? S2T goes like that. <coughs> Fine? And S3T goes like that. Oops, sorry, this is 0, this is T. So you can see that the waveforms are all containing a pulse over a different portion of time, non-overlapping portions of time. 
and for this reason you can possibly call this waveform a forary pulse position modulation right where the position of the pulse decides uh, the nature of the waveform okay yet another example of orthogonal set of waveforms is a set of pulses like this right as you can see if you were to multiply them out and integrate the result they will be uh, the integral will turn out to be 0 any pair of them right and this is called four array code shift king C standing for code okay so basically we have a different code for representing each waveform different binary code right so these examples are sufficient to show that one can construct a fairly large variety of orthogonal set of signals right now uh, you want me to display that for a little longer all right please say so if there is any problem of that kind and at any stage okay okay um, one typically uses when whenever one uses orthogonal set of signals <coughs> one typically uses very large values of m right uh, you in fact one can construct larger families of amory orthogonal pulses in the same way It will not be surprising if you come across systems which use values as large as m equal to 32 or m equal to 64, okay. They are in common use. Another point to note is, and this point we discussed also in the context of binary orthogonal signaling, loosely speaking motivated by the fact that FS key is a very important member of this, fam uh, this family uh, this class of signals are called collectively also loosely known by the name of Emory FS key. So generally uh, we, we may also refer to them as Emory FS key or Emory FS key type signals right or some, sometimes simply referred to as MFS key right. MAFSK is briefly sometimes denoted by MAFSK. Let us talk about the energy budget here. We may have so many different possible ways of uh, constructing MRE signals. We can choose different values of M and come up with a different modulation scheme, right, for the same situation. Now, how do I compare all of them? When, you, when I compare them in terms of energy, obviously when I choose a different value of M, uh, the total energy that is being used to transmit that signal uh, is representing different number of bits, right? Because the moment I change the value of M, the number of bits corresponding to that also changes. So it is more useful therefore to talk about not the, just the total transmitted energy in the MRE case by the transmitted energy per bit, right. So if EP, we, if you remember each pulse here carries an energy E sub P, right. This energy E sub P is actually used for a symbol of length K in our binary to MRE mapping, right. Uh, so it is where K is, so it is distributed over, this energy is distributed over K bits where k is equal to log m to the base 2. So therefore the energy per bit, I am sorry, energy per bit will be how much? E sub p upon k or E sub p upon log 2m. 
it is this energy which is important when you are comparing different modulation schemes or different Emory modulation schemes for that matter, right? So suppose you were to ask or you were interested in asking a question, uh, what happens when I go from m is equal to 2 to the power k to 2 to the power k plus 1? Well, you look at the performance and look at the corresponding energy per bit and then you can make a meaningful comparison, okay? So Eb, E sub B, which is the energy consumed per bit will be equal to E sub P upon K or E sub P upon log M to the base 2. So this serves as a common basis of reference, uh, let us say for performance comparison of different modulations, diff different Emory modulation schemes, right, different values of M. So there is one important family of Emory signals which one can use and are very commonly used. Now the next family that I will consider, let me start with a different color just to put some variety, are simplex signals and the motivation one can derive is from the fact that perhaps you may feel that orthogonal signals may not be the best class of signals from some point of view. Intuitively you may feel like that. At least from your binary experience you may feel like that because your binary experience that you conventionally have is that of on-off king versus polar king, right? On-off signaling is an example of orthogonal signaling that you are familiar with. Polar signaling is an example of antipodal signaling that you are familiar with, right? And you have a reasonable appreciation even though we have not gone into detailed performance comparison so far because we haven't looked at that, we haven't looked at even optimum demodulation at the moment, so we can't really talk about performance comparison. But you have an intuitive appreciation of the fact that antipodal signaling gives you better performance than polar signal, uh, than uh, on-off or orthogonal signaling, at least for the binary case. Right? So a useful question to ask therefore in the Emory context is can we construct generalization of antipodal class of signals which uh, constructed from the bind, in, in, constructed in some way which have similar properties as that of antipodal. Now what is the essential property that distinguishes antipodal and orthogonal signals in the binary case uh, in the context of correlation. Right now we are using correlation as a measure of similarity or dissimilarity of waveforms that we use, right? Isn't it? In the orthogonal case, the similarity or dissimilarity is measured by finding out whether or not the correlation between various waveforms is zero or not, right? In the antipodal case, what is the similarity or dissimilarity measure? The correlation is negative in fact. Negative. Right? Yes. We like to go from to signal sets which are not only zero, which don't only have zero correlation, in fact they have less than zero correlation, they have negative correlation, right? That is if it is Pt, then otherwise minus Pt. And in general, a negative correlation between signals of a signal set in Emory schemes is a more desirable property than a zero correlation, right? That is something that uh, will become clearer and clearer as we go along. For demodulation, particularly for demodulation, because that that basically means that various signals in the set have a larger distance in some sense with respect to each other than in the case of orthogonal signals. So, uh, basically, simplex signals are motivated from that kind of consideration. Okay, so let us see uh, how they are defined. Actually, one can construct a family of so-called simplex signals from any given family of orthogonal signals, okay? So any orthogonal family of M pulses, let us say each of energy E sub P can be used to construct a simplex family.
Right. The way it is done is as follows. From each signal SMT in the original orthogonal family, uh, I subtract the average value of all other pulses, in fact of all the pulses, including this. Call this, let us say Q empty. Okay. So, from SMT for any value of M between 0 to capital M minus 1, I am subtracting the average value of the signal, right? The average value of the signal set and generating a new waveform which I am calling Q sub MT. So, I get a new set of waveforms Q sub MTs where M goes from 0 to M minus capital M minus 1, right? This signals QMTs form the uh, so called simplex family and I think the um, special case of binary becomes obvious that it will lead to when when you choose M equal to 2 it will lead to antiporal signals right and that is quite obvious. So, how I mean, how does it specifically lead to antiporal signals? For M equal to 2. For m equal to 2, it will lead to antipolar signal. <laughs> For binary case, it will lead to m. m. Isn't that obvious? Like, uh, so, uh, this is a confusion regarding the basic definition of antipodal. Like, uh, basic definition of antipodal is very like simple. Opposite signs, that's so. all. Uh, yes. What was the definition we talked about for antipodal? So minus pt and plus pt. Minus pt and plus pt. That's precisely what you are going to get in the binary case. Of course, we can't talk about that concept in the m case. Isn't it? That is why we have to talk about a different concept which you are calling simplex. But binary case becomes a special case of this. All right, isn't it? Suppose in the in the suppose I start with the set zero and PT, which is the on-off set, right? That will lead to after this procedure minus PT by two and PT by two, right? So that will lead to a uh, Antiporal set of signals. So uh, now let us talk about the properties of the simplex family. <coughs> First of all, if you are to calculate the energy of each pulse that results, <coughs> that is, if you are to do the exercise of Calculating the integral of mod QM, uh, QMT square, right? You expect it to be the same? No. Yes. You are in for a slight shock. It will not be same. Uh, I like so you to do that. It is a better, very simple computation. So please do that yourself. I am not going to uh, spend time on doing that. It is very simple algebra. And what you will find is, it is 1 minus 1 upon m into E sub p. So, the energy carried by each signal in the simplex family is smaller than the corresponding pulse energy of the orthogonal family from which the simplex family has been constructed. Okay? So, that is the first thing that uh, they have less energy than the orthogonal family. Right? Second important point to notice is that simplex pulses are not orthogonal. Right? So, simplex pulses are not orthogonal. In fact, they have the more desirable property of negative correlation, right? Can I remove this? 
that is a stronger prop we, we can say that they contain a or they have a stronger property stronger in the sense that they are more desirable in this kind of applications of negative correlation for example if you choose two different values of m m and m prime let us say and they are not equal uh, the correlation is given by qmt qm q sub m prime t of course uh, uh, prime should come here and conjugate should come here integral between minus infinity to infinity will be equal to minus e sub q upon m or minus Mm -hmm. Can I write it in terms of E sub P? What will it be? Okay, let, I think just leave it like that. Just check whether this is correct or not. I'm having a small doubt about it. Hmm? For the binary case, uh, it is okay. Because uh, because that will give rise to two, right? E Q by two. That is correct. Okay. In any case, please uh, verify this. Now, why we call it a stronger property is I already mentioned. Uh, let me put it in the writing over here. We'll study later this. Uh, we'll study this point later, but I'll just like to mention this property here. That you'll find that the simplex set, uh, simplex set, gives the same error probability as the orthogonal set from which it has been derived. Right. So what is the advantage? The advantage is it is giving the same performance with a smaller energy. Right. Sir, yes. The point here is that the energy transmitted might be less, but the fact that we are constructing it from the orthogonal signal. That much energy is being used, isn't it? No. We are not transmitting that energy. What is important is uh, how the energy is used on the channel, right? How much energy is actually, how much power is pumped onto the channel, right? The construction is a very, uh, very trivial process as a transmitter. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that some, some this encoding scheme, SMT minus in the summation of all this, yes. by this, that encoding we are bringing down the energy level. But of each pulse, yes. But the energy that we are giving to the system, mm -hmm. channel included, is still the same. No. Because no. we are Why giving SMT that is being generated. Um, pulse generation mechanism is a local mechanism of your uh, circuits at the transmitter, right? I mean, you may do the whole exercise at a very low power level. What is ultimately <coughs> important is how much energy is finally pumped in onto the channel, right? So, in fact, uh, this construction mechanism is only artificial in that sense. That doesn't define how much energy is actually being put on the channel. That will be finally decided by the power amplifier you have, right? Okay. Okay, the point that uh, I want, wanted to mention, which I have mentioned to you, uh, simplex set gives the same error probability as the orthogonal set. With smaller energy. So it is more energy efficient, right? And something that is more energy efficient is more ap more useful, at least in a power constrained channel, right? That's the meaning of power constraint. That we, we are short of energy, and we like to make very efficient use of energy that we might have at our disposal, like in satellite communication. And now this is something that I will uh, just mention to you as an interesting thought. And maybe some of you can take that up for your own personal research. There is a very long-standing conjecture, although nobody has nobody has so far been able to prove this or disprove it for that matter. Uh, which 
it's a conjecture because it's neither has been neither has been proved nor a counterexample uh, found so far. Of all the Amory pulse uh, pulse alphabets of given energy E sub p, the uh, there is no other um, alphabet which can give you smaller probability of error than the simplex set. Okay, let me mention it. Of all the Amory pulse alphabet <coughs> of energy E sub P or E sub Q whatever, none has smaller T sub E than simplex. Of course, you have to specify the conditions on the normal kind of channels we uh, do this analysis for which is the additive white Gaussian noise channel. That is when uh, you encounter white Gaussian noise on the channel, then simplex signal set, Emory sim simplex signal set is the best. And you already know that for the binary case, right? We have discussed that for the binary case. This is the corresponding result for the Emory case. But it is an interesting uh, point that I have made here for you that uh, maybe some of you can try to prove or disprove it. Okay, so what we have done so far is the Emery orthogonal family and the Emery simplex family, which can be constructed or expressed in terms of the Emery orthogonal family. Now, uh, there is one more family of uh, Emery signals which, which one can uh, derive from the orthogonal family and is simply called the bi orthogonal family. And it's very simple. You take any set of, you start with any set of m by 2 orthogonal pulses. And we can now construct a set of m so called bi orthogonal pulses, which is simply <coughs> the m by 2 orthonormal pulses that we started with, you include those in the set along with, this is I am just saying union with, the negative of each of these pulses. Okay. So for example, if you start with S sub 0 t to S m by 2 minus 1 t, right? then just add the negative of each of these to the set. You have a family of M signals which are called biorthogonal. Okay? You can think of an n-dimensional space right, in which each orthogonal excess of the space, orthogonal basis function of the space is used to represent one different signal and then you are also taking the uh, signals corresponding to neg negatives of each of these basis functions, right? That is the bi family. For example, uh, in the signal space representation which we will be taking up separately later, suppose these are, these represent two orthogonal sets, uh, orthogonal signals in a binary orthogonal set. For example, this may represent a signal P1T or let us say SOT and this represents S1 T, right? They are just being used as basis functions for an abstract space of this kind. Then a bi orthogonal family will be simply obtained by using this along with this and using this along with this, right? So, what you will notice is the dimensionality of the space will not increase. We will be working in the same space, m, m by 2 dimensional space, but the number of signals that we are going to use is larger, right? right? Now, some other uh, points of uh, interest in the context of Emory orthogonal and other Emory schemes that we have discussed so far. 
We have talked about energy calculations and how we like to compare the energies whenever required. We initially mentioned that these are signals that can be used when bandwidth is not a limitation, right? I like you to appreciate that fact better here. Let's talk about what happens to bandwidth as M increases in this class of signals. If you look at typical examples that I have given you, you will get a feel for that, right? For example, look at the 4D FSK example that I gave you hmm? and so on. As I increase the value of M, you will have to put more and more such signals and it may appear intuitively that necessarily the bandwidth has to go up, right? Increase in the value of M that is putting, um, uh, uh, putting uh, using larger and larger chunks of k bits to map into waveforms is necessarily associated with increase in bandwidth. So all the Emory schemes we have discussed so far have this problem that is uh, bandwidth literally grows with them. And there is no attempt on our part to constrain the bandwidth, right? All we are interested in is that the orthogonality condition must be satisfied or the simplex condition must be satisfied and so on. We are not even explicitly or consciously try to do anything about the bandwidth, right? The bit rate will uh, yes, we will have to see the bandwidth efficiency, uh, in, but the overall bandwidth is going to go up, right, uh, as the value of M is going to increase. We have to still see how bandwidth grows with respect to uh, increase in number of bits that we are simultaneously we are carrying out. Uh, no, it will depend on the kind of signals that we use. You cannot make a very general statement about that. All we can say is it will grow in but some sense. That is offset by the fact that, you know, moreover, I mean, the bit rate is increasing m times. Yeah, but the bit rate is only, you know, only increasing log to m times, times, whereas the bandwidth will be increasing much more than, much faster than that, right? Because you are having m, a set of m signals, necessarily your bandwidth is going to go perhaps at least linearly, if not more, right? So therefore, uh, that increase in number of bits that you are representing with this m, the set of m waveforms, is not necessarily an offsetting factor as far as bandwidth is concerned, okay? Yeah, that. So there is no attempt to constrain bandwidth and increasing M is associated with more bandwidth. Therefore, the question arises, what should we do in bandwidth constrained channels when we want to go for MRE schemes? what approach to take, where we cannot allow any increase in bandwidth at all, no matter what is the value of M, okay? Now, what kind of approach comes to your mind? We briefly talked about it last time. We are going to necessarily have to work with band-limited pulses, right? And typically, we will decide on a band-limited pulse shape or perhaps a set of band-limited pulse shapes, if you so desire. Usually, it is convenient to zero on to a single pulse shape PT, right? And then construct the Emory waveform around that pulse shape. And then the options that you have are very few in number, right? You, it's going to be now very difficult to construct orthonormal or simplex or other kinds of families once you put this bandwidth constraint, right? The most commonly used option is in fact, uh, what is called Emory ASK or Emory PM. Okay. So, what a, a signal space representation of the same would be? You chosen a pulse shape. I think I have a figure for that somewhere. You might have chosen a pulse shape, and let us say this line represents that particular pulse shape. This is the basis function in this one dimensional space which is represented by PT. So this point here represents the signal PT. Then in the binary case we know what the corresponding thing is. You can use minus PT. You can construct a four level signaling 
by using different four different amplitudes right or an eight level signaling by using eight different amplitudes but the basic pulse shape remains pt only you are using that pulse shape with different amplitudes okay so these are the kind of constellations or signal space diagrams that you work with when you are working with uh, bandwidth constrained MRE signaling. An example here um, of a waveform, uh, if four array waveform corresponding to MRE ASK, where I have just for the sake of illustration chosen a triangular pulse with four possible different amplitudes, right? This is one amplitude, this is another, a third and a fourth. These are the four amplitudes that are coming up and you have associated with each of these amplitudes a binary sequence of length 2, right? So when the two successive bits are 1, 1, maybe you transmit this amplitude, 0, 1, this amplitude, so on, okay? So that is an example of memory ASK. Of course, this is not a good example in the sense that this triangular pulse is not going to be strictly band limited also, right? Typically, we are going to use pulses which satisfy the Nyquist criteria, right? And the, namely the sync pulses and that family. I think we will stop here and we will uh, next time do or consider pass band modulations for both binary as well as MRE cases. They are quite, quite different in philosophy and uh, style. Okay. Uh, the, most of the material again will be available in any other books, though not in this form. Uh, the book that I am following at the moment will not be easily available to you. So, uh, it is called Blahut, uh, Digital Communications by Blahut. Can you spell it? Yes, I could. Are you Blahut? Hmm? Okay. <laughs>